It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And you, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God... But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in these moments, these moments that are so fleeting and yet so precious and so alive in your hands, how we want to ask together that in these moments we would meet you, that the staggering scale of what you are doing in our world and in our lives with each and every one of us today. Oh, may we see and grasp these things afresh. May we praise and treasure and adore you for who you are, for we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Well, I want to ask all of us this morning, whether you're renting a property or you're uh, a homeowner, I want to ask us this morning, what do you prefer, a new build property or renovating an old property? It's good things in both of those, isn't there? Uh, you take uh, the new build, built right from scratch on a new piece of land, what are you going to get? You're going to get proper insulation, aren't you? You might even get a smart home. Everything is digital. You're going to be energy efficient. Everything just works, doesn't it, in a new build, a huge relief. But I think we know, don't we, as well, as much as that is attractive, we know, don't we, that there is a different kind of beauty, isn't there? A certain kind of glory in restoring a classic. There is a grandeur, isn't there, to things that are older. Would you agree? That building a few hundred yards up the road that we're going to renovate, God willing, later this year, and that we're going to move into in the future, Queen Street Church. When you're, when you're in it and you look up, as majestic as this roof is, the roof in the Queen Street building is stunning, isn't it? And I think we all know that if we were to build a modern church on a, a piece of field somewhere out in Aberdeenshire, we would not be erecting a building in this day and age with that kind of roof. Well, there is something magnificent about what is old, being restored, being returned, being renewed, new life put back into it again. Friends, as we look at Ephesians together today, as we look, work our way through this letter, God has a master plan for the universe. I wonder if you remember the master plan from three weeks ago. God's master plan is renovation, restoration. God's master plan is not new build. Just put your eyes on chapter 1, verse 10. God has a plan. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. God has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. God is going to take all the old, fragmented, alienated parts of this universe, and he is going to bring them together in perfect unity under the authority of Christ. All things restored, all things renewed, all under one head, 
one ruler. All things will be together under Christ as king. That is God's plan. And so this morning, uh, the question is this. If God is going to do that, if chapter 1 verse 10 will one day happen, what does God need to do to make it happen? What has to be fixed to make chapter 1 verse 10 come true? I I think if you were to canvas absolutely anybody in the world today, everybody has an opinion about what is wrong with the world, don't they? Everybody does. Children in Sunday school have an opinion about what's wrong with the world. Not enough ice cream, not enough sweets, not, not enough time on the Xbox. The teenager has an opinion on the problem with the world. Their parents. The resident who lives next door to you who wants to fix the pavements or the potholes in the road or the prime minister or the president who wants to get the whole country back on track. The person at the top of the chain who who is convinced that if we could just fix this one thing, everything will be well. Education, COVID policy, foreign policy, healthcare, immigration, trans rights, economics. Brothers and sisters, friends, today the Apostle Paul says to us in these words that we're going to look at together, He says to us very, very clearly that none of those things are the fundamental problem with the world. None of those things solved will put the world back together again. For the core problem with the world is what? Me. Me. You. We are what God has to fix, aren't we? If, if one day everything is going to be brought together in a renew, renewed universe, put, putting me back together again, putting you back together, putting us back together, together as a group again, bringing us to Christ and beginning to restore us to who we were always meant to be, that is the way that God will put the universe back together again. Oh, don't, don't we know that's true? Oh, we know it, don't we? I, I know it, friends, more and more with every passing year. I am what is wrong with the world. I am what is wrong with the world. See, it, it means that God, God's master plan to fix everything, it's a huge scale, isn't it? The universe. What are you going to do one day? Fix the universe. But God's master plan to do that is not a broad sketch using a massive, big, wide paintbrush on a huge canvas. No, God's master plan actually is much more like an architect's sketch, isn't it? With every minute detail captured. If you're going to build a grand building, you want an architect who knows exactly things down to the millimeter, don't you? God is interested in the details. And friends, if one day everything will be together, Ephesians chapter 2 says then God is going to do that person by person by person, brick by brick, life by life. See, if you look at the the picture that chapter 1 verse 10 gives you, everything restored, imagine that picture in your, your mind's eye, Christ as king on the throne and the universe under his feet working the way it's meant to work. What happens if you zoom in on each individual pixel? Who do you see? You, me, us, brothers and sisters, you are what God is going to restore. One person by one person by one person so that the end result is a restored universe. Here is how God builds his masterpiece. I want to show you two things this morning from these verses. Very simply, what we once were Number one, what we once were. And number two, what we now are. You see the the contrast, verses one to three, and then in verse four you get but, but God. There's where the hinge turns. We move into what we now are. And in verses one to three, I want to show you what we once were. I want to show you three things about what we once were. And in verses 4 to 10, I want to show you three things about what we now are. So you know the drill. I've said two points. You know the drill. It's actually a six-pointer. Actually, within one of them, there's even another three things to see. So I, I give up counting. 
Number one, what we once were. Here's the first thing to see about what we once were. Do you know what's wrong with the world? Paul says, we were dead. We were dead. That's the first of the things to see. The world is populated by the living dead. He, Paul almost literally uses that phrase, doesn't he, in verse 1. Look at the way he says it. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you, uh, other translations would say, in which you used to live. You were dead in the way in which you used to live. He, our version says you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Do you see what he's saying? You were dead when you used to live like that. Even though you were alive, you were dead. Your, your heart was beating. Your muscles were working just fine. You were running and exercising. Your blood was pumping around your body. You had three children and five grandchildren, and you had a successful career. You were respected in your community and admired by your colleagues. And while you were alive, thriving in every one of those areas, you were at the same time spiritually dead. Spiritually, you were a corpse. You, you, you were blind to the glory of God. You were deaf to His Spirit. You had no love for Christ. If somebody had taken your spiritual pulse, Paul is saying in those days, if they'd taken your spiritual pulse, there would have been absolutely nothing there. Flatlining all the time, every day, dead. Friends, you'll never hear that anywhere else but here in a church from the Bible. Nobody else will ever tell you that if we're going to fix everything, if God is going to remake the world, if one day everything is going to be okay, if one day everything is going to work the way it was always meant to, and if one day everything in heaven and on earth will be brought together so that evil is gone and sin is no more and suffering is finished, nobody else will tell you that for that to happen, God has to raise the dead. He has to take spiritually dead men and women and make them alive. Just look what it means to be dead. All, all we're going to do today is walk, walk through the words in this passage. Look what it means to be dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Two different words for something negative. And they, they paint a picture of death that is very black indeed. Trespasses. It's, it's the word for a false step crossing a boundary line that is not meant to be crossed or, or deviating from the right path that you're not meant to leave. And sins is a falling short of a standard. It's, it's missing a mark like, like an arrow being fired and landing short of where it's meant to hit. That that's what you were like, Paul says. You, you constantly fell short of God's standards. And you constantly crossed the line, constantly crossed it. Look, look at the depth of those words. Both of them cover the positive and the negative aspects of our wrongdoing. In trespassing, we actively cross the line. What did we say in our confession of sin? We have done what we ought not to have done. And in the word sins, we passively fail to reach the goal. We have left undone what we ought to to have done. We commit and we omit. We rebel and we fail. And Paul says the result of those two things is death. Death. What does the sign on the gate say? Trespassers will be prosecuted. Isaiah chapter 59, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your iniquities have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you were spiritually flatlining. And here's the second thing to see. Notice the next layer of depth that Paul adds here now. We weren't just dead, but we were bound. We were enslaved. Dead and bound. Look at verse 2. Dead in the way in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. 
Now notice here, not just two things that killed us, trespasses and sins. Now notice three things that held us. First, we were bound by the ways of the world. Do you see that? Following the course of this world. The course of this world. That, that's what we used to do. It's true, isn't it, that out Inside these walls, there is an entire social value system, an entire way of society being organized without any reference to God. That worldview, that, that way of looking at things, that value system permeates everything. And, and Paul says it dominates everybody within the walls of its kingdom. It doesn't matter whether you're in the East, in China, or the West, in the USA. It doesn't matter whether you're postmodern, or modern, or young, or old, or trendy, or grandpa. Paul is saying people are held captive simply by an outlook on the world that is alien to God. Yeah, several years ago, when, when, when we uh, had smaller children, a friend of mine used to say to me, he didn't have any children at the time. Uh, my friend is, at, at very best, I guess, an agnostic, possibly, possibly an atheist. And very often my friend used to say to me, uh, smiling, how's it going with the brainwashing of your children? Taking them to church every Sunday, they've got no choice, have they? You're taking them along, forming them in this way of looking at the world. It's Richard Dawkins, isn't it? It's what he says, how's it going with the brainwashing? Now that same friend of mine, several years, several years later, has his own children. And with his wife, they are bringing their three children up with no reference to God whatsoever or no knowledge of God. Do you know what my question to him is? How's it going with the brainwashing? You are bringing your child up according to your value system, the, the things which you hold dear. And if you do not get those values from Christ and his kingdom, you get them from where? From the ways of the world, the course of this world. Bondage to the world. Secondly, bondage to the devil. You see that following the prince of the power of the air. The Bible uses different images to depict the devil to us, doesn't he? A real personal force of evil. Sometimes he's a lion. Sometimes he's a murderer. Sometimes a, a deceiver. Here he is a ruler. The prince of the power of the air. The, the person who's, who, who's operating out there powerfully. And he is at work in those who are spiritually dead. But thirdly, not just bondage to the world not just bondage to the devil. Who else were we once enslaved to? Verse 3, ourselves. The passions of our flesh. In other words, our own fallen, self-centered human nature that operates as the command center of our lives. That's who we were enslaved by. Now, notice again the further explanation of what that means. Look, look at the way Paul just keeps filling in the details. We were enslaved to the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Isn't that interesting? Held in slavery by our own minds and by our own bodies because, because driving both of those things, driving our minds and our bodies, is a twisted, sinful human nature. See, it, maybe some of you have had this. You've been on, on a bicycle or a car. You've been driving and you've hit something that you weren't meant to hit at high speed. And the steering column in your car has had a jarring impact. And from that moment on, the alignment is off course. You're traveling down the motorway and it, it will not go straight. You try it sometimes, don't you? And just off it goes. You've got to correct it and bring it back. The Bible says we're like that. We do not have our desires in a straight line. We, we naturally, constantly, instinctively experience the desire while we are veering off to the left or the right. There is now a distortion introduced into the desire. So the, the, the natural bodily desire for food that God put there in the garden becomes gluttony. The natural bodily need for sleep becomes sloth. The natural appetite for sex becomes lust. 
but not just the body, the mind, the, the capacity to think truthfully and beautifully and lovingly and sacrificially. What happens to the mind? Pride, false ambition, rejecting things that we know to be true, malice, revenge. Friends, look at the picture in verses one to three. Is it not astonishing? We were dead. We were bound. We were slaves to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the result of all of this, here's the third thing about what we once were. We were dead. We were bound. Number three, we were doomed. We were doomed, condemned, like the rest of humanity. Look at the second half of verse three. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath. Have you ever thought of that when you visit a friend who's had a new baby? You take their precious little child in their hand. Don't say this out loud to them. Children, child of wrath. When we were born, we, we, we were not like the shiny new car that comes out of the factory where, well, we, you hope, don't you, where the, the steering column works immaculately. It's perfectly attuned. Everything is aligned, and it drives in a perfectly straight line until maybe one day, two years, three years down the line, it has a prang, and then it's gone wrong. No, no, that the truth is that the human race, ever since Adam and Eve, the truth is that we are more like a factory now where every single car comes off the assembly line with a fault built into it, steering off to the left or to the right. There is a fault in the very way the thing is put together. By nature, we are like this, Paul says, and by nature, it puts us at alienation, at odds with God. Each and every version of the same thing is made broken. That's what we're like. We are born with our sinful nature curved in on itself. You parents learn this. You never, ever teach your child to be selfish, to be self-interested. You never teach somebody to lie or steal or deceive, do you? No, we inherit the family condition. We are in solidarity with our first parents. We have the family likeness. And so we inherit by nature the condemnation of God that hangs over a wayward world. What a picture what we once were. I mean, just, just think about it tomorrow. Imagine it over coffee. The newspapers are out and everybody's talking about the news of the weekend and Ukraine and Russia and COVID and Boris Johnson and Partygate and all the rest of it. Is anybody ever going to say, well, look, of course, the thing that's wrong is that the world is populated by the living dead. We're all enslaved. We are all objects of God's wrath. No, no one's going to say that, are they? Think about it. The, the vigorous body of the athlete, the lively, alert mind of the scholar, the vivacious personality of the film star, the kindly demeanor of your work colleague or your relative, the patient generosity of your friend, and our view of them and the Bible's view of them and Paul's view of them from Ephesians chapter two is that they are dead, dead. And yet, friends, and yet, do you notice that although verses 1 to 3 are a true description of the world, do you notice that Paul is talking about us here, not the world out there? That is what you were, we were, he keeps saying. We, we. Here's the significance of it. That, that view of the world is never given to us so that at coffee time tomorrow, we set ourselves up here above others looking down on them. Oh, yes, I, I don't read the newspapers, those, those terrible things happening out there. It's never given to us so that we could preach at the world. It's given to us so that we understand what it is God has done for us. The point of all of this is that we understand just how powerful God is and just how good God has been to us in his grace. So just look at the contrast with me now, verse 4. Look what changes, what we once were. 
to what we now are. And again, three things for us to see. We are alive, we are raised, we are seated. Number one, we are alive with Christ. Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. God made you alive together with Christ. Be, being brought from death to life is amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Some of you will remember Christian Eriksen, the Danish footballer. Last year in the, the middle of the Euros, his heart stopped in the middle of a game. You can see the awful scenes. He reaches the edge of the pitch and then just collapses. We lost him, the medic said. He was gone. Some of you will remember Fabrice Muamba years ago playing for Bolton Wanderers. One of the first times this happened, he suffered a cardiac arrest in a, a game against Tottenham. Fabrice Muamba's heart stopped for 78 minutes. 78 minutes of no heartbeat. And yet, incredibly, both footballers survived. Somebody made them alive with what? Well, I don't know. I don't know the details. I guess it was equipment of some sort. Hands, maybe. It's amazing, isn't it? Somebody did something to make them alive. Friends, that is what God has done to you and to me. Taken our dead, bound, condemned hearts and made them alive with Christ. He made you alive. That's the first thing to see. Secondly, he raised you with Christ. Not just resuscitated you, not just revived you, but raised you with Christ. See, look, look back again at chapter 1, verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believed. What, what is the most powerful thing in the world that God has ever done? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Do you see what Paul's saying? The greatest display of power there has ever been in the universe was when God raised Jesus from the dead. And Paul says, chapter 2, verse 5, that resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, is not the only resurrection you need to know about. God's power is seen in two resurrections, not one. Yours, along with Christ's. Mine, along with Christ's. I want you to notice here, this is all I want you to take away today, the second half of chapter 2. I want you to notice how Paul is tying us to the Lord Jesus and saying that everything God did for Jesus, he also did for us. You see that? He did not simply make us alive with Jesus. He did not simply raise us with Jesus. Here's the third thing. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms. See, to be seated is to be in the place of judgment, the place of authority, the place of respect and power, the place of universal rule. See how this third aspect of what we now are overcomes the third aspect of what we once were? Once we were condemned before God's throne of judgment. Now, where are we now? Seated with Christ at that throne of judgment. Friends, he, here are some of the most amazing truths in the whole Bible. On the third day, when Jesus rose again, do you see what Paul is saying? He did not rise alone. He did not rise alone. As his body came to life, as the tomb was broken open, as death was exploded and destroyed from the inside out, as he returned to heaven's courts, victorious in his might and power and eternal glory, so he led with him a whole new humanity of men and women to whom he was giving his, 
his now eternal everlasting life. People who are joined to him so that everything he is, they become. Everything he has, they own. Everything he will be, they will be. I wonder if you know that this morning as you sit here bringing to church. Well, I don't know what you're bringing. Heartaches, joys, sorrows. Do, do, do you know what you have with Christ? You have a king a head, a representative, somebody acting for you on your behalf and whose every possession belongs to you. It's just like the children in your family, isn't it? Where you live, they live. If you change your car, your children change their car. If you move house, they move house. If your surname is McDougal, their surname is McDougal. Paul is saying God's master plan in remaking the world and bringing everything together is that his son, the Lord Jesus, is the true and proper man. He is the second Adam, the one who came to undo everything that had gone wrong, to put right everything that we had broken, to do everything the first Adam was meant to do. And as he does it, he joins people to him who share in his victory and rule. Look how Paul puts it in verse 7. God did all of this. Verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Any of, did any of, any of you see Christian Eriksen, the footballer I mentioned, his, his interview? He's just signed for Brentford. Anyone see the interview that he just did recently? I, I don't know what Christian Eriksen was like before what happened to him in the Euros. Let me tell you, if you watch that interview now with Christian Eriksen, you, what do you see? A profoundly humble, grateful man. I, I shouldn't be here, he said. Every day is amazing, and I get the opportunity to, to play again, to live again. Look what God has done. In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace towards us in his kindness. You know, it's, it, I guess it's a lot less fashionable these days among younger couples in their homes. You, when you visit young couples, you don't tend to see these anymore. But in older homes, older generation homes, isn't it true that you tend to see a display cabinet somewhere in the living room, perhaps, your best room, Maybe you've got one at home. What do, you, what, do you, what do you put in it? Your best crockery or your, your finest ornaments? Maybe there's some back lighting in there, protective glass in front of it. It's expensive wood, isn't it? It's nicely polished, oiled wood. And the most precious, expensive things you have are placed in that cabinet in a place of prominence for you to show off to all who enter your home, for everyone to see, here is what I'm proud of. Whether you've got a display cabinet or not, we all do it, don't we? The car on the drive, the ring on the finger, the, 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 the picture on Instagram, the painting brought home from school to show mum and dad, the degree certificate on the wall. Friends, when God does that, when he does what we do, display something to the world, what does he show off? When he puts something on display, what is it? Verse 7 says it's, his grace. That's what he wants to show to the world. He puts on display, he shows the immeasurable riches of his grace. That is what God wants to put in the place of central prominence in the universe. It's a way of God saying that, look, as the centuries tumble forwards and as we one day move into eternity, throughout all of eternity, God wants to put his grace at the very center of displaying to the universe forever who he is. He wants the eyes of every living being in the universe to see it. He wants every light trained on it. The way to display his grace, the, the thing that God actually wants to hold out to the universe is his son. And his son's people joined to him. You know this morning, friends, Trinity Church and any other local church that you've ever been part of and one day might be part of, these local churches 
are the display cabinet of God's indescribable grace. I mean, look at us, men and women who have virtually nothing in common at first, apart from Christ making us alive. How many of us here are going to rule the world and have our names remembered in lights forever? No, we're ordinary, dead, bound, enslaved, doomed people, made alive. You know, some, some of us this morning just can't believe we're here, can we? we? We don't have display cabinets at home because there's nothing to show for ourselves. And we certainly don't think we belong in God's display cabinet. Oh, but do you see it? Can you see it? it? It is precisely the people like that who do not make it into the world's hall of fame that display God's grace. That's why it's called grace. The people that everybody else overlooks, God selects and makes alive. Some of us this morning, friends, have stopped looking at the Lord Jesus. Verses 4 to 10 have dropped out of our horizon. All we see is verses 1 to 3. We're just looking at ourselves. We've forgotten, or or maybe we've never even actually understood. Let, Let me put it like this. We've never maybe understood that the Lord Jesus Christ is not a single man. He is not a single man. He is a betrothed man. When he left the tomb, he left the tomb with his bride on his arm. He he is married to you. And what is his is yours. And all of us this morning, all of us, wherever we are, we need to look at ourselves less and the Lord Jesus more, don't we? You, You think you don't fit in God's restored masterpiece. Maybe I might make it onto the canvas somewhere tucked in off to the side at the back somewhere because of who you are, what, you, what you've done, what, what you were enslaved to. It, it haunts us. It comes with us. And Paul says, you need to know you're married now. God has joined you to Jesus. And because he's at the center of everything, and because you're with him, everything is okay. You know, friends, one day God will bring everything together. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the rightful ruler of heaven and earth. And at the heart of that remade, restored, renewed universe, at the heart of it will be a society of pardoned rebels. Men and women rescued from death row, brought home, ushered into the treasure vaults of the family estate and told that everything that you can see here is yours. All of this belongs to the Lord Jesus. And because you belong to him, all of this too is yours, is ours, is mine. Amen.